Namaste. We welcome to the Pediatric Endocrinology for Postgraduates, a virtual national level meeting by experts from all over the India. Now I request our President Madam, Dr. Shaila Bhattacharya, very dynamic in teaching program and also in the other academic activities. She will be chairing the session and I request both Dr. Shaila Madam and also uh, patron and advisor for ISPE, my professor Dr. Agupati sir, we welcome you. We welcome Dr. Sudharao Professor, Padia Hospital and uh, Dr. Sanjeeva Gian is an associate professor from IGACH Bengaluru. He will be the examiner for this session. Ragupati sir is also examiner and we have two guides. Dr. Vani Hachan, associate professor from Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health. She is guide for the case of uh, Acandroplasia case and uh, Dr. Amisha, clinical geneticist from Wadia Hospital, Mumbai. Over to you, madam. Thank you. Good, good evening, everybody. I, I, I am in the past time. I'm still patients are there. Okay. Um, uh, we should congratulate uh, Amma, Dr. Amarnath for taking this initiative. And uh, this is all for postgraduates. We used to see all these cases, but nowadays uh, the postgraduates have forgotten these cases. So this is to refresh you people and also us. And we always used to say these are rare disorders, but I feel they're no more rare. We see plenty of these cases. It's only in your eyes. So what is in your mind and in, you can see in your eyes. So I think um, next two hours, we will be seeing all the uh, wonderful cases. I wouldn't again say rare because they are common. It's only that we need to identify them. I think uh, we will have a good session today. All over to you, Dr. Amarnath. Thank you, madam. Thanks for your blessings. Now we'll go to the first case. It is case of Achondroplasia, the case presentation from Sahana Ayan. She is the third year postgraduate from Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health. She will be presenting case of Achondroplasia. Five minutes to seven minutes presentation and ten minutes discussion. Discussion will be done by Dr. Raghupati Palani. He is a professor of pediatric endocrinology in Bengaluru. And uh, Dr. Sanjeeva Jian, he is associate professor, Department of Clinical Genetics from IGICH, Bengaluru. We are very lucky to have two cl clinical geneticists here, one more uh, geneticist from Wadia Hospital. We appreciate if Amisha Madam from uh, Mumbai, she can join for the discussion. Over to Sahana. Meeting starts now. Sahana, you are mute. Unmute, unmute yourself. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, is the screen visible? Yeah, visible. Go ahead. All the best. Yeah, is it in uh, slideshow? Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Sahana Yan. Uh, I'm a third year PG from uh, MD Pediatrics from Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health, Bangalore. My moderators are Dr. Wadi Ma'am and Dr. Raghupati Sir. I'm presenting a case of a one-year-old girl child who was born on 6th of January 2020 uh, from hailing from Hassan, Karnataka, informant being the mother who is a reliable uh, informant. Presenting complaint was the child was brought with an history of not gaining adequate weight, uh, adequate length, you know, which was noticed by the mother since six months of age. History of presenting illness, one year, one month old girl child who was brought with history of not gaining adequate length for the age, noticed at six months of age as compared to other children of the same age. On probing, child was noted to be feeding well and mother had noticed uh, a child with a large head size and relatively shorter limbs in the child compared to other children of the same age. Negative history. In the child, there was no history of cough, hurried breathing, uh, uh, difficulty in breathing, recurrent respiratory uh, tract infections. There's no history of uh, chronic diarrhea 
polyuria, polydipsia, decreased activity, constipation, or intolerance to the cold, and there was no uh, history of skin changes or hair changes in the child. Past history, there was no history of previous hospitalization, so there was no history of any trauma or fractures in the child. Family history, this was a second born child to a third degree consanguinously married couple. There was no history of, uh, there was no similar history in the sibling or any other family members. Uh, and there was no history of short stature or dysmorphic features in any of the family members. Antenatal history, uh, first and second trimesters were uh, uneventful. Uh, in, a third, in the third trimester, 38 weeks of ultrasound showed, uh, uh, parents were to told that the child has short right and left femurs and was told to have a skeletal abnormality in the child. Birth history, it was a term gestation, born through normal vaginal delivery, birth weight of 2.8 kgs. Baby cried immediately after birth and there is no NICU stay in the child. Child is And child is immunized up to date according to national immunization schedule. Diet history, child was exclusively breastfed for six months of age following which complementary feeds were started and child is taking adequate calories and proteins for the age. Developmental history, development, uh, uh, gross motor, fine language and speech and social uh, were appropriate for the child uh, when the child presented to us at one year of age. Coming to social, uh, social economic history, uh, the family belongs to lower middle class according to Kupuswami social economic status scale. Uh, uh, coming to summary at the end of the history, it's a one year, uh, one month old girl child, second born to a third degree consanguinously married couple with antenatal ultrasound in the third trimester showing bilateral short femurs who was brought with history of inadequate growth noted since six months of age with apparently large head and short, uh, shorter limbs with normal development and sufficient calorie protein intake in the child with no recurrent or chronic illnesses and no history of, no family history of short stature. Uh, differential my differential diagnosis at the end of the history is the child was noted to have short stature according to the history with normal development. So uh, with the uh, uh, with the prenatal diagnosis of shorter limbs, if you were keeping that in the mind, my first TD was skeletal dysplasia in the child. The second one is chromosomal abnormalities such as Turner syndrome as this was a, this is a girl child. And the third is metabolic bone disease. Could uh, even vitamin D deficiency could present uh, with these features. And my last TD was endocrine uh, causes such as uh, growth hormone deficiency. So Come to general physical examination. Then we'll wait there. Uh, Dr. Sanjeeva, would you like to comment on the history? Would you like to ask any questions? Sir, I mean, uh, basically this child has, uh, uh, I mean, uh, definitely the growth delay uh, prenatal onset, especially when they have found uh, short femur uh, in the third trimester. So we don't expect metabolic bone diseases like your rickets or I mean, classical deficiency rickets uh, presenting uh, before antenatal period. Uh, yeah, it's a very good clue. Uh, definitely this points towards your uh, uh, skeletal dysplasia. But we should also keep in mind uh, IUGR as one of the cause for short femur. It is the most common cause for uh, short femur. Um, seen in the third trimester. I think rest of the things are fine. Chromosomal abnormality again, usually, uh, okay, Turner syndrome is something which you can think of. Uh, other chromosomal abnormality can also present with short stature, but they will have uh, some amount of intellectual disability and other uh, features also. My comments at this stage would be uh, the proportion, proportion of the body and uh, even at birth, you can make out the disproportionate uh, uh, features. The trunk is normal and the limbs are short. The head looks a little large and that's the very classic description of achondroplasia. And uh, so the diagnosis can be made then and there. And uh, I was curious why this child had an antenatal ultrasound, ultrasound and the deformity was detected. No further information was given to the parents? Uh, no, sir. They were just told that the child has a skeletal abnormality. That's all, sir. Okay. That's a bit unfortunate, uh, don't you think so, Dr. Sanjeeva? Yes, sir. This was like a spotter. I mean, most uh, pediatrician would have seen uh, achondroplasia in their uh, career. Yeah. 
and as you said it was easily diagnosable at the time of birth even before that also if they are uh, good enough uh, so at birth it should have been diagnosed one month is too late especially in this uh, i mean era where people are aware of this condition and it would have they would have been diagnosed early uh, for sahana i would like to say if you had proposed if you had uh, mentioned the word disproportionate short yes. and then you wouldn't have thought of the other possibilities at all okay and uh, uh, this proportion is possible in uh, maybe down syndrome or turner syndrome but uh, this is a very classic spotter kind of a thing and uh, yes. so sir if you can speak loudly it will be good sir little you are yeah as dr sanjeev has said Uh, the other possibilities, especially growth hormone deficiency, is not possible because it's a very classic, proportionate child. It's a smaller version of a bigger child, and uh, so uh, differential diagnosis can be uh, limited. Okay. Yes. Does yes. Dr. Shaila or Dr. Sudha want to make any comments? Yeah. No. Uh, one is yes. Of course, um, it it could be a spotter. Uh, maybe we have not seen the child as yet. So based on her history, she is talking of antenatal intrauterine diagnosed some short limb state condition. So um, based on the history, it is an early onset prenatal onset kind of the things. And this child you you mentioned as developing normally. and there are no systemic illnesses at all so this child is otherwise well developing normally only is short so there is no delayed development there is no other organ system involvement so antenatally diagnosed short limb is essentially is the picture that we are talking of in terms of differentials so i agree with sir that growth hormone deficiency is not a disproportionate short stature so but we are yet to come to the examination uh, based on the history you are you are talking of a antenatal onset um condition where the bones are considered as short ami can you give us some input or anybody can give us some input where we say the fetal uh, ultrasound the antenatal ultrasound speaks of short bones what are the differentials in history which we should keep in mind uh she will be joining shortly madam she is traveling uh, we'll wait uh, she has presentation also down syndrome can also have short uh, fever right yeah. yes sir so i mean prenatally uh, uh, manifesting uh, short limb dwarfism uh, again points towards skeletal dysplasia the other differential di non skeletal dysplasia diagnosis will be more of this again chromosomal abnormality even down syndrome can present with a short femur but uh, again as sir said it it will be proportionate and um, even um, other chromosomal abnormality turner and all can present with short stature and non skeletal uh, causes for uh, short femur in the antenatal period will be your iugr and uh, most common non lethal skeletal dysplasia presenting as a short femur is your achondroplasia um, suppose if you see a child uh, if you see a fetus with a short femur you have to look for the thorax and you have to measure that um, uh, the ratio between uh, femur and thorax uh, ratio and that will determine whether it's a lethal skeletal dysplasia or non lethal skeletal dysplasia if it is a Uh, the ratio is very uh, um, uh, small then uh, it goes more towards lethal skeletal dysplasia where uh, the most common cause is again thanatophoric dysplasia or um, uh, um, uh, other uh, lethal skeletal dysplasias uh, in non lethal skeletal dysplasia definitely uh, achondroplasia is the is in the top of the list okay please proceed with the clinical findings examination yes sir a uh, general physical examination child was alert and active at the time of examination and the vitals were within normal range 
uh, coming to head to toe examination uh, child had wide open anterior fontanel of 3 cross 3 cm which was at the level and was pulsatile posterior fontanel was closed uh, child had frontal bossing child had depressed nasal bridge present with saddle nose with mid facial hypoplasia Uh, uh, limbs were uh, in the limbs. We could see proximal shortening of the limbs, uh, and uh, child had trident hand. That is, there was increased divergence between the middle finger and ring finger, and there was Harrison sulcus noted in the chest with abdominal distension with slightly averted umbilicus. But the uh, sp spine was apparently normal, and genital genitalia being normal. This is a picture of a trident hand. Coming to anthropometry, weight of the child was 6.5 kg. Uh, length, uh, length was 64 centimeters. Weight for height was between minus one to minus two standard deviation. Head circumference was 46.5 centimeter, which was normal. Mid arm circumference was 11 centimeters, and upper segment lower segment ratio was 1.65, uh, and expected for one year age child being 1.35. Uh, this is uh, the the anthropometrical uh, uh, length and uh, uh, weight being uh, plotted on the growth chart. Uh, IP modified WHO chart uh, with, for zero to eighteen years, uh, and the mid mid parental range for this child was one fifty to one sixty two centimeters, uh, but observed length was uh, less than third centile for the child. Head circumference was between uh, one to two standard deviation. Systemic examination, uh, central nervous system examination. Child was alert and active. Tone being uh, reduced in all the limbs, and power was four by five in all the limbs. But DTR being normal. Uh, other systemic examinations were within normal limits. Coming to my differential diagnosis at the end of uh, uh, the examination, being it's a disproportionate short stature, uh, which is rhizomelic in uh, which is rhizomelic short stature, as uh, proximal limbs were uh, shorter compared to the distal limb, that is, uh, arms being shorter than forearms and thighs being shorter than the legs. My first uh, diagnosis would be achondroplasia. Uh, second thing could be uh, other 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 prob uh, probable DDs are hypochondroplasia and pseudo achondroplasia. And uh, later, uh, the, when uh, the investigations which we did were a blood investigations such as complete hemogram, uh, liver function tests, renal function tests, uh, serum calcium phosphorus, vitamin D, and thyroid function tests were done initially, which were all normal. Karyotyping was done in this child, which showed 46 XX, uh, and skeletal radiography was done, which showed in the pelvic X-ray we could see. Uh, we saw uh, more flattened iliac bones, uh, uh, small iliac wings, uh, and uh, which which was uh, along with that we could see uh, in the limb X-ray we could see a uh, short tubular bones. Here we can see femur being shorter than the fibula, and uh, uh, and uh, spine X-ray showed small cuboidal shaped vertebral bodies with short pedicles throughout, with progressively narrowing uh, interver intervertebral disc uh, intervertebral spaces, uh, mainly near the lumbar region. Yeah, and uh, even in craniofacial X-ray, we can see calvarial bones being larger compared to cranial base and facial bones, which are usually small. And the next thing which we did was genetic analysis was sent for this child. Uh, mutation you, testing you, for again. Can you leave the X-rays on for a minute? What you yes. should have mentioned is the metaphyseal changes. These are very characteristic. Okay, we don't usually yes. mention that, but. This is a very very characteristic finding: the metaphyseal changes in all the long bones. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, interpedicular distance. The interpedicular yes. distance usually widens at the region of the lumbosacral region, Lumbar. and yes. then narrows again. But in this case, it uh, tapers down, and this is called a dagger sign. Okay, and that's a very characteristic yes. abnormality, skeletal abnormality, which is seen. And you got a very nice pelvis X-ray showing the triradiate pelvis. Okay, and the greatest yes. vertex notch is usually very narrow, and uh, those are important things. And these may be kept for uh, you people in the exam as uh, spotters, or they may be asking you about the X-rays. And uh, so, please remember that. Okay, carry on. 
Uh, this is the genetic analysis which was done in the child which showed mutation for FGFR3 gene. Yes. Uh, and I, uh, so our final diagnosis was uh, achondroplasia in the child. And I want to speak a few words about achondroplasia. It's the most common chondrodysplasia, in instance being one in 15,000 live births. Uh, it is inherited through autosomal dominant inheritance with a mutation in FGFR3 gene, uh, uh, codon 3AB on the chromosome number 4P. Abnormalities which we see is uh, usually growth abnormality uh, where the child presents with short stature. And the mean adult may, uh, height in the male is 118 to 145 centimeters, and mean adult female height would be 112 to 136 centimeters. Craniofacial abnormalities are megalocephaly, megalocephaly small foramen magnum, short cranial uh, cranial base, uh, low nasal bridge, prominent forehead, mild facial display, uh, hypoplasia, and nor narrow uh, nasal passages. Skeletal abnormalities are small cuboid shaped vertebral bodies with short pedicles and progressive narrowing of lumbar inter interpedicular distances. Lumbar lardosis, which becomes prominent when the child starts to walk, small iliac wings with narrow, greater sciatic notch, and short tubular bones. And other abnormalities are mild hypotonia in the child. Early motor progress is usually slow, which presents as mild motor delay, and intelligence being normal with a trident hand. Occasional abnormalities, which, which we see is hydrocephalus, spinal cord root compression, pulmonary hypertension, synostrosis of multiple sutures. Diagnosis is mainly by clinical examination, skeletal radiographs, and genetic analysis, and treatment being a mainly supportive treatment. And the newer drug which is uh, uh, used is versatitide, which is a CE uh, uh, nitrodipeptide analog, uh, which, uh, which helps to overcome the inhibitory effect of FGFR3 signal at the growth plate. It helps it enhances the growth uh, growth in the child and uh, we also have a growth chart for achondroplasia uh, uh, to plot and to monitor the growth in the child this is the chart which i have used for my case uh, uh, this is a chart for the uh, girl, uh, girls with achondroplasia of six months to 48 uh, months thank you uh, thank you very much sahana uh, Ami, madam, you have any uh, comments or anything to add? Uh, no, thank you, Dr. Amarnath. Uh, a very nice, crisp presentation, Sahana. Kudos to you. Uh, the only thing I would add is probably just one thing which I would have done different was not really advice for a karyotype because the clinical picture was so diagnostic. You can make out just from the photo of the picture that you are suspecting achondroplasia and the x-rays would be supporting it. But uh, other than that, I think it, it was all good. Okay. Uh, Sanjeeva, sir, you have any other comments or you want to do? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, as Madam said, it was a crisp presentation. Only thing I would like to add here is this new drug. Uh, this is also retired uh, or um, I mean, initially it, they used to call it as uh, uh, BMN111. Uh, this uh, this uh, drug is a newly approved, uh, FDA approved drug. This was approved uh, uh, recently in June of this year. Uh, so this drug is currently approved for children above seven years. The only problem in this whole, in, in this uh, condition is the height. So this will uh, improve the height of the child and uh, so that the quality of life will also be improved. So this drug is now approved uh, in the FDA, not available in India. We don't know the cost also. Biomarin is the company which is coming out with this. Probably we will have to keep this in mind when we are counseling the parents. We don't know. I mean, this child is still one year old. When when child becomes around six or seven years, we may, we may get this drug in India. So we need to keep the, this in mind when we are uh, talking, uh, when we are counseling the parents. And also, I mean, uh, the health surveillance, what you advise, we usually advise um, uh, measuring the head circumference every three months once uh, after one year, up to one year every month and then height. Um, and uh, because uh, hydrocephalus is one, one uh, common um, complication, most of the time we don't do, we, we, um, it's just wait and watch policy. So we need to keep that in mind. If, uh, if there is a hydrocephalus causing any uh, complication, then we need to address that. Thank you. That was excellent uh, discussion by Sanjeeva, sir. Madam, uh, will you present the case here itself? You want to present few slides? Ami, madam? Yeah, sure. I can go ahead with it. Yeah. Thank you very much, madam, for agreeing for short presentation.
Uh, I think uh, Sahana has to stop sharing the screen. Yeah, Sahana, you stop sh sharing. I hope you can see my slides. Yes, madam. Slide show, you need to go. Yeah. So I think Sahana has uh, covered quite a bit, but what I'm going to again just harp on is that achondroplasia is one of the commonest uh, causes of disproportionate short stature. And the onset is from infancy. And the reason why I'm saying that is you have other conditions, which I will just come to in further slides, which mimic achondroplasia. And they generally have a later or a milder onset. And as we know, it's an autosomal dominant disorder. And it is largely de novo. What we mean by de novo is generally the parents are unaffected. And it is the first child who, you know, comes to the fore in the family. Rarely nowadays, because of, you know, increased awareness, you have situations where, you know, you will have two achondroplasia, uh, male and female marrying each other or two skeletal dysplasia disorder patients marrying each other, in which case the scenario might be different. And classical features like we just saw in the case was rhizomelic shortening of the limbs, that's proximal shortening, macrocephaly, facial features which are very characteristic, and the classical trident hand which all of us are aware of. So very recently, just about two years back, we have clinical practice guidelines which have come to help us in terms of diagnosis, management, and for surveillance purposes. Obviously, these are just guidelines and, you know, you can sort of change depending on the situation. What they've come up is with a sort of a criteria to help clinicians, you know, who are not very well aware of this condition to diagnose. And they have divided into A, B, C and D. So A being symptoms and in that short stature and rhizomelia is point number one. Characteristic facial configurations make point number two, like you can see in this uh, you know, in this child where you have a protruding forehead, a flat nasal bridge, very classical bulbous nose tip and relative protrusion of the mandible. And uh, the head circumference will generally be on the larger, larger side, especially for the height and even for the age. And then you have the classical trident hand, which is there, which is basically because of shortening of your phalanges. And there is widening of the space between the middle and the ring fingers and it appears plain. Now this forms the symptoms or the A part of thing. The B part of the guidelines is by the radiological features. And like we all know, any uh, suspected uh, skeletal dysplasia child that we have, we have something called as a cell, skeletal survey that we do, which includes your skull. You will have hand x-rays. You will also have a chest and a spine x-ray and a pelvic x-ray along with lower limb. At least you need the femurs. In smaller babies, you can get an infantogram as well. And in this, in case of achondroplasia, you see tubular bones which are thick and short, uh, you know, with a large width of the metaphysis. Interpeduncular distance, like Dr. Raghupati mentioned, uh, is quite classical and it decreases progressively in the lumbar spine. Pelvis, you will see narrowing of the sciatic notch and the iliac wing will classically be rectangular or round in shape. You will have cranial abnormalities and hand abnormalities as well. What we need to remember in clinical practices, a lot of times these radiological picture can change with age. So you have to keep in mind uh, that sometimes all features may not be there classically when you're seeing a neonate or an infant. And serial x-rays can sort of uncover these findings. So this forms the B. You can see there are five points in this. So three points in your symptomatology or clinical features, five points in your x-ray. Now, uh, the diagnostic criteria basically says that, you know, you have to classify, uh, satisfy all the three clinical features and all the five radiological features to have a definitive diagnosis. And on the right hand side of my slides, you can see the classical differential diagnosis of other kinds of skeletal dysplasia, which can mimic achondroplasia. Obviously, if you have a confirmed genetic diagnosis, then definitive diagnosis is generally obvious. 
Now, probable and possible is when you do not satisfy all of the five and three criteria, but you have excluded the other differential diagnosis. And in this situation, you can probably consider doing a genetic test to confirm your clinical suspicion. Now, what I was mentioning is this FGFR gene uh, is very notorious in the sense that, you know, it has multiple clinical presentation. So, achondroplasia is not just one type. Only thing is the type of variant that we see, the location that we have for achondroplasia is very, very specific. Uh, but mutations in the same gene can give you multiple different phenotypes. And sometimes you can have an overlap, especially with hypochondroplasia, which I would just put it for our you know, general purpose understanding as a milder version of achondroplasia, where the features start becoming prominent a little after one year of age. So someone coming to you in the neonatal period, like in this present case, you would definitely think of achondroplasia. But later onset, do think of hypochondroplasia as one of the possibilities. And like she mentioned, diagnosis, this is a single gene disorder due to mutations or variations in FGFR3. And most of them are detected by sequencing analysis. You can opt for a targeted panel. Just doing the FGFR3 gene is also fine panel or exome sequencing. And lastly, surveillance, like Dr. Sanjeeva mentioned, is very important. So we do not stop just at diagnosis. We do need to offer them surveillance. And in this case, it is extremely important to monitor the head circumference, the craniocervical junction, and the spinal assessment, because these three are the commonest locations or causes for complications in these children. Also, audiologic evaluations a lot of times because of middle ear abnormalities or recurrent ear infections can be seen. So definitely get an assessment of your craniocervical junction and uh, if feasible, affordable, a neuroimaging of the brain focusing on the ventricular size for the hydrocephalus and the craniocervical junction is should be advised. Management-wise, like she mentioned, supportive is the way to go forward. But for short stature, like Dr. Sanjeeva mentioned, uh, you know, vosoritide has come up, but we are still a little dicey on it. Limb lending procedures are also there. And neurosurgical, uh, you know, support in case of complications. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amisha, madam. That was an excellent presentation. Short and lucid. Uh, thank you, Sanjeeva, sir. Now I request Raghupati, sir, to give some comments because most of the patients, uh, parents and guardians, they ask about the growth hormone. Uh, Raghupati, sir. Sorry, I'm muted. I've got some slides and at the end of the program, I'll do that. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Now we'll go to the... Uh, Second case presentation uh, by Dr. Jainab Gilitwala from Wadia Hospital, Mumbai. The case for discussion is Nuko Palishakaradosis. Again, the examiners will be Dr. Raghupati sir, Sanjeeva sir, and Sudhara Omedo. Go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, share my screen. Yeah. Uh, good evening all. I'll be presenting a case of... Slideshow. Go for slideshow. Yeah. Good evening all. I'll be presenting a skeletal presentation in a metabolic disorder. My moderator is Dr. Amisha, who's a clinical genesis at our hospital at BJ Wadia. Uh, so my case is a 10-year, 6-month-old male, second by birth order, born out of a non-consanguinous union. He presented with complaints of abdominal distension since 8 months of age. He was not gaining weight and height since 2 years of age. Stiff limbs and flexion deformities at multiple joints since 3 years of age. Loss of milestones since 3 to 4 years of age. And an episode of head trauma at 8 years of age, following which patient had quadriparesis. The birth history was a full-term normal vaginal delivery, birth weight of 3.5 kg, no perinatal asphyxia, no NICU stay. Developmental quotient for all four domains is between 25 to 30 percent. 
family history is interesting the mother had 10 siblings one is alive the 11th sibling and but the 10 before her uh, there were six born before her four male children child and two female children the male the mother says that this they were of similar phenotype but she is not sure and the female she is not aware of the two male the three male children that were born after her she is sure that they were they all died at the age between 7 and 8 years and are of the similar phenotype as her child she has one living brother who is alive and well the mother has had two marriages the first marriage she had a child that was 10 years old who died at 10 years old and similar phenotype as a current child who is currently 10 years and 7 months all the ones who are black and dark are of the similar phenotype and the light gray ones the male children we are not sure whether they are the similar phenotype and female children uh, before her we are not aware of what was their phenotype so at 8 months of age first the parents noticed that the child had generalized abdominal distension which was progressive uh, at 2 years of age they noticed that there was inadequate ga uh, gain in weight and height at 3 years they noticed that there was stiffness of limbs which was gradually progressing and had led to flexion deformities and contractures at multiple large joints and small joints at 3 to 4 years of age they noticed that the child has had loss of milestones and at 8 years of age he noticed that he had a head trauma following which the patient had quadriparesis the mri brain done at that time was suggestive of an infarct in the right basal ganglia and the right middle cerebral artery territory the mr angio was suggestive of bilateral narrowing of the internal carotid artery there was further regression of milestones post this event zena can you summarize before you go ahead just on clinical history in short yes ma'am so ma'am my uh, patient is a 15 year 6 uh, month old child who has uh, complaints of abdominal distension inadequate gain in height weight stiffness of limbs and regression of milestones with a very strong positive family history this is suggestive of a uh, just uh, like most likely a lysosomal storage disorder uh, and uh, parents also uh, gave the on further probing said that there was history of macro, uh, large head and thickening of skin that they had noticed that the stiffness had begun uh, this gives us a clue that there is some kind of deposition that is happening in all uh, the uh, other store it indicates that it is a storage disorder so we were basically thinking of a condition which is affecting multiple organs possibly a storage disorder with which is probably x linked because we have a history which is strongly suggestive of other male affected members and a mother who's unaffected right yes ma'am go ahead yeah on examination ma'am Uh, the child had coarse facial features a bulky nose thick lips thick eyebrows and a large forehead there was no corneal clouding haziness on naked eye examination there was thickened skin umbilical hernia hypertrichosis appreciated over the back this flexion contractures of upper limb at elbow joint and lower limb at knee joint widening of the bilateral wrist stiffness of limbs and fingers which are present and the fingers are currently curved Skull's spine was normal his smr was prepubertal the clinical features here we can appreciate the coarse facial features the flexion deformities at multiple joints the curved fingers the widening of the wrist and the hypertrichosis at the back his anthropometry the child uh, height was 105 cm sds score of minus 3.65 Weight is fifteen point eight kg and uh, SDS score of minus four point seven five. He was his height is well below the mid parental height that is shown in the red uh, lines, and this is and the upper segment lower segment ratio which was point eight four which is less than minus two standard deviation. This indicated that it was a disproportionate short stature. On systemic examination, there was no organomegaly. CNS examination, it was the child was conscious oriented. Reflexes were normal. power and tone could not be elicited as there were flexion deformities at the large joints so to summarize the four important uh, findings that we found in our patient is global developmental delay coarse facies skeletal dysplasia and short stature the first thing that comes to our mind when we have these four uh, significant findings is 
mucopolysaccharidosis. Now the differentials to this disease were GM1 gangliosidosis, oligosaccharidosis, and mucolipidosis. Just to give a brief overview, if if we had just findings of short stage and skeletal dysplasia, we would think of other uh, differentials like achondroplasia, spondylar epiphyseal dysplasia, multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, and other types of MPS like MPS4 and renal and endocrine causes. Just to give another brief overview, uh, if the child had just global developmental delay, short stature, we would think of cretin, along with coarse faces, we would think of cretinism and chromosomal anomalies. To summarize, my child is a 15 year, six month old male with coarse faces, disproportionate short stature, regression of milestones with multiple joint contractures, no vision or hearing loss, with no organomegaly, with a strong positive family history. Most likely a case of lysosomal storage disorder. To rule out mucopolysaccharidosis, mucolipidosis, oligosaccharidosis, GM1 gangliosidosis, Tay Sachs disease. Uh, Dr. Sanjeeva and uh, Dr. Sudha, ma'am, would you like to comment on anything so far? I think, ma'am, it's an excellent presentation. The flow is really good. And I think she has brought uh, the things uh, really well. Um, the only thing I would like to add here is we need to consider the age of the child. Uh, currently, the age of the child is around 15 and a half years. And we don't expect uh, children with uh, mucolipidosis, especially with coarse faces and developmental issues. So it goes to mucolipidosis type 2. So uh, those they don't usually survive beyond 5-6 years or so. And even GM, GM1 gangliosidosis, especially the early onset one the, are the one which will present with uh, the skeletal issues and coarse. Intermittent type may not present like this. And even type 3 uh, ML, that is mucolipidosis, will not have that much of uh, mental I mean, ment global developmental delay issues and uh, Tay Sachs again you will not have. So more or less she has brought the clear picture of MPS and I, I think she can straight away say that this is probably a mucopolysaccharidosis. Uh, I mean for academic reason we can bring in these uh, differential diagnosis uh, but definitely she can go ahead and say mucopolysaccharidosis as her diagnosis um, and with uh, cornea she can uh, able to say clear cornea it goes more towards your type 2 so she can make a diagnosis of type 2 on clinical basis. I just wanted to mention that uh, recurrent infections, history of recurrent infections. I don't know whether you mentioned and I missed. That's also important because if it is mucolipidosis, uh, recurrent infections are very common. And uh, also uh, you said skeletal dysplasias. Uh, I didn't uh, hear any skeletal deformities being mentioned. Are there any? Uh, so the uh, spine is normal, but there are multiple uh, joint deformities and widening of the bilateral wrist joints, sir, yeah. uh, and uh, thinning of the limbs. Yeah, but it uh, didn't look like a skeletal dysplasia kind of a thing. And, uh, uh, of course, there are other um, manifestations. The facial features are usually very characteristic in this condition, coarse faces, and that, that also should be emphasized on. That's what I thought. Uh, sir, I mean, one more thing I would like to add, I forgot to mention. Uh, another condition, I mean, this is probably not at the level of uh, postgraduates, MD pediatrics, but definitely for those who are doing beyond that. Uh, is a condition called uh, DMC, that is Digby McLeod Clausen syndrome, where you have skeletal issues, uh, mild coarse faces, and uh, de um, developmental uh, issues also. So maybe that's a close DD for uh, MPS. Uh, I mean, not definitely not for MD pediatric students, but definitely who, who are interested, who want to look further. It's one of the mimicker of MPS. I too wanted to mention one more finding, which uh, I forgot. Distension of the abdomen, when you say, usually it means organomegaly. Even in the case of uh, achondroplasia, uh, Sana mentioned that the abdomen was distended. You can say the abdomen looks protrudent. You know, it uh, is not actually distension in that case. In this case, I'm surprised there is no organomegaly. In this case, abdominal distension is likely 
due to organomegaly but you said there was no organomegaly are you sure yes sir the child had no organomegaly and yes sir you were correct it is more of a protrusion than an abdominal distension okay okay uh thank you dr ragupati and dr sanjeeva i completely accept your comments the reason why we had put the venn diagram was just for the post graduates to understand the probable differentials we yeah. were not thinking of skeletal dysplasia for this child and i yeah. accept dr sanjeeva's comments about tsax and gm1 that you know we might not really require that as a differential but just for because it's a pg teaching we had just put it in thank you then up go ahead uh just to give a uh, understanding of if you have a child with a suspected bone deformity first we would like to find out whether the child is short stature or tall stature if the child is short stature we would rule out systemic illnesses renal and endocrine causes then we would uh, check the upper segment lower segment ratio if the child is proportionate or disproportionate if the child is proportionate whether the child has dysmorphism present or absent if the child has dysmorphism present we will think of a chromosome anomaly example noonan syndrome if the short stature is disproportionate we would think whether the we would look at the child and find uh, look for any dysmorphism if there is dysmorphism present we would think of any systemic involvement if there is systemic involvement the first thing that would come to our mind is mucopolysaccharidosis if there is disproportionate short stature with dysmorphism present but no systemic involvement we would think if there is a clue like a blue sclera we would think of osteogenesis imperfecta or like our earlier case we would think of fgfr3 group if the child is disproportionate short stature with dysmorphism absent then again we would see if, if there's a clue of multiple fractures then you would think of osteogenesis imperfecta and then the basis of radiological evaluation whether there's epiphyseal metaphyseal involvement we would think of spondylo epiphyseal dysplasia spondylo metaphyseal dysplasia metaphyseal epiphyseal dysplasia and if it, the child is tall stature we would go in another direction thinking of other syndromes like marfan syndrome eller danlos syndrome um th so to everyone this is just a very simplified simplified form you know to help for you know uh, the post graduates on how to go about evaluating a child who comes with skeletal dysplasia or short stature or suspected bone deformity so i'm sure there are lots of uh, missing points here but this is just a simplified form uh, sort of a flow chart to help them understand thank you Our, we did a skeletal survey of our child the child had uh, pointed metacarpals and bullet phalanges which are appreciated in the x rays of the hands the child had oar shaped ribs we can which we can appreciate in the chest x ray a thick calvarium which is seen in the skull x ray and on the spine x ray we can see the anterior beaking of the vertebrae this complex is known uh, these findings are suggestive of the diastosis multiplex complex how did we investigate our child we did the preliminary exam uh, testing of cbc which was not suggestive of any bicytopenias rft lft was normal the calcium profile was normal the child's vitamin d was more than 160 nanogram per ml which was done after multiple intake of vitamin d supplements outside and a tft that was done which was normal we further went and did uh, other uh, Uh, organ evaluation like ophthalm uh, evaluation was normal there was no cataract no corneal haziness vera was suggestive of a mild bilateral conductive hearing loss 2d echo was normal with a uh, with our first impression of mucopolysaccharidosis we went ahead and did urinary glycosaminoglycans which was positive we did a genetic test for this patient a sequencing analysis which showed a hemizygous hunter syndrome pathogenic variant this is the genetic report of the patient just to give us a uh, overview of the recognition pattern of the multiple mucopolysaccharidosis that are present uh, there is uh, seven types whether starting from hurlers type 1 and our patient which was the case of type 2 mucopolysaccharidosis which is hunter syndrome he did not have corneal clouding which was a first clue with the positive family history of exling recessive as sir rightly mentioned it was a clinical um uh, case of uh, type 2 uh, mucopolysaccharidosis hunter syndrome and on depending on which uh, find uh, clinical uh, find uh, finding we uh, get in our patient we can uh, 
differentiate which type of mucopolysaccharidosis it is before getting a genetic test done. Now the investigation strategies in a mucopolysaccharidosis, we got urinary glycosaminoglycans, qualitative test positive for our patient. Then we can do an enzyme assay which in which we can culture the leukocytes or fibroblasts. And the final confirmatory test will be a sequence analysis, which was positive for our patient. Management of uh, mucopolysaccharidosis is mainly enzyme replacement therapy and hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And supportive management for the complications that these patients develop with all the glycosaminoglycans that are deposited in the different organ systems. For our case, that was the Hunter's syndrome. That patient can be a candidate for hematopoietic stem cell transplant and enzyme replacement therapy. But the enzymes do not cross the blood-brain barrier, so the neurological um, uh, uh, findings and the neurological affection cannot be reversed. Ma'am, would you like to add something here? No, I think uh, Dr. Sanjeeva is going to be speaking on mu mucopolysaccharidosis later, so I'm sure he'll be covering the rest of the things. Okay, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Team Vadia. Especially to Dr. Amisha, Madam, and uh, Dr. Sudharao, Madam, and Dr. Jaina for taking lots of pain. Both the case presentations were excellent and uh, discussion was also excellent. Uh, it could be a ASCII or even theory questions most commonly asked. Now we'll go for the uh, second part of the program, that is the lecture on mucopolysaccharidosis by Dr. Sanjeeva Jian. Over to you, sir. Sir is the associate professor and uh, in charge of Department of Pediatric Genetics, Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health, Bangalore. Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, actually, I thought that since this is for uh, postgraduates, um, I thought that uh, I will cover the approach to mucopolysaccharidosis. Uh, this will be helpful for them even in their ASCII and um, routine clinical things. It's very basic. Uh, I'm not going into the um, details of each and every um, type. So we all know the mucopolysaccharidosis. As soon as we see the case, uh, we can suspect that uh, this, this could be one of the, one of the mucopolysaccharidosis type. And these are various phases of mucopolysaccharidosis at various age. Again, the time is um, important here. Uh, the child may, uh, the presentation may change over a period of time. So uh, the phase will change over a period of time. So uh, it's a type of lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, uh, and uh, enzymes involved in the degradation of glycosaminoglycans, that is GACs, are dysfunctional. And excessive accumulation of these GACs are responsible for all the clinical features. This results in skeletal deformity and uh, mental retardation and decreased life, life expectancy. So again, it's a heterogeneous group. Uh, there are six main type. Uh, I mean, seven slice is a very uh, rare one. We don't see much uh, I mean, uh, in our setup. I don't know about in other part of country. And there are many subtypes in each groups also. Uh, and the manifestation depends on the accumulated substance, what type of gag accumulated in the body that will result in the, um, uh, the organ affected and ultimately the manifestation. So all these conditions, all, uh, all the types are autosomal recessive inheritance except type 2, that is hunter, which is X-linked recessive. Now, uh, this is the, uh, I mean, uh, um, different types of MPS and the uh, underlying enzyme deficiency. I think this is available and the gag which is uh, accumulated uh, in the body. So type 1 has got again three subtypes, 1H that is hurler uh, and she and there is an in, in, uh, intermediate type called uh, hurler she uh, syndrome. All these are due to deficient enzyme uh, alpha L uh, idolinase uh, idol uh, enzyme. Here, dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate is accumulated. Type 2 is hunter. Uh, idorinate 2 sulfate is deficiency. There, uh, dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate are accumulated. And uh, uh, type 3, San Filippo has got four subtypes. Uh, there are four enzymes which are deficient here. The underlying gag which is accumulated is uh, HS, that is a heparin sulfate. And Marcio is the type 4, again, type A and type B. Again, there are two different enzymes. 
here keratin sulfate and chondroitin sulfate is accumulated and type 6 is a martiolami type of um, uh, type and uh, here the dermatin sulfate is um, accumulated and type uh, 7 is slight that is uh, um, beta glucuronidase is um, uh, the enzyme which is deficient here all the three that is chondroitin sulfate dermatin sulfate and heparin sulfate is accumulated so one clinical clue is uh, wherever there is uh, heparin sulfate is involved you will have CNS issue, mental deficiency. Uh, uh, whereas dermatin sulfate, chondroitin sulfate, or keratin sulfate is uh, involved, you will have mesenchymal abnormality in the form of skeletal dysplasia. Now, how do you approach? The first is whenever we, we have been talking uh, right from the evening, from the first presentation, uh, coarse faces and coarse faces. What exactly mean by coarse faces? So this is the coarse faces. They will have large head, hairy, and skull uh, bossing usually a very predominant forehead and they will have very bushy eyebrows corneal clouding may be there may not be there in 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 uh, i mean uh, one or two conditions will, will not have corneal clouding they will have a very broad and thick heavy face you can you can feel that face is very heavy um, and the uh, lips are thick there will be gum hypertrophy and large protruding tongue and they will have uh, pectus and protuberant abdomen. Uh, Raghupati sir mentioned it, the abdomen is protruded rather than uh, distension. It's a protruded abdomen. And they may have visceromegaly, may not have umbilical hernia. And even other hernias are also seen. And they will have wrist widening, gibbous and disastrosis multiplexa. So basically the course which is heavy uh, is, is, is a pointer towards your mucopolysaccharidosis. Now, once you identify the course phases, again, the degree of course phases may be severe to very mild or no course phases. So the, the severity may differ uh, in the spectrum of these MPS. So once you identify the course phases, once you suspect the um, uh, mucopolysaccharidosis, look for corneal clouding. If there is no corneal clouding, probably we are dealing with MPS type 2. And, and sometimes what happens in an early stage, you may not find a corneal clouding clinically. So during that time, a slit lamp examination may throw you uh, some uh, light on the uh, uh, deposition uh, in the corneal, uh, in the cornea, corneal membrane. So you should, you should be always careful when you are saying there is no corneal clouding. Make sure that a slit lamp examination is done and even the uh, subclinical deposition is also ruled out. If, if you can able to rule out corneal clouding, so probably we are dealing with type, type 2 MPS. And then the next, uh, um, when, 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 you, when you are uh, seeing a child who has got a coarse facies plus corneal clouding, look for the involvement of CNS. If there is a CNS involvement, probably we are we are seeing a child with MPS 1H, that is Hurler phenotype, or MPS type 3. Uh, if there is no uh, CNS involvement, probably we are seeing with a MPS 1S, that is she, or 1HS, which is in the intermediate form, or MPS type uh, 4, or MPS type 6. So, course phases with corneal clouding, mental retardation, or no mental retardation. So, MPS1, so when you deduce this, so MPS1 will have mental retardation and disastrosis multiplexa with coarse faces and corneal clouding. MPS3 will have more of a behavioral problem. Initially, they, they will be doing fine. They will have more behavioral problem, but they will have very minimal disastrosis multiplexa and minimal corneal clouding. You will have only on the examination, some deposition. Maybe in the later age, they may develop some amount of, but, uh, some amount of corneal clouding, but usually that's not a predominant feature. Whereas uh, MPS1S is a very milder form of type 1, no CNS involvement and older age of onset. And MPS4 is similar to type 1, but MPS6 is similar to type 1. So they will have severe course phases, but no CNS involvement, their joints are stiff. Type 4, usually they don't have course phases, but they will have the same phases. If you see a MPS4, Anywhere in the world, they have the same face, but it is not very coarse. The coarse, the coarse face is very minimal or many a times it may not be there. And most significant point in MPS type 4 is lax joint, especially of the um, uh, smaller joints of the hand. So if you see any uh, MP, suspected MPS and you have a lax joint, probably we are dealing with a MPS type 4. And their skeletal involvement is very severe. It is, they say it's a disastrosis multiplexa plus. So they will have additional 
uh, features apart from your disastrosis multiplexa and the shaft structure is extreme in case of MPS type 4. So then what is disastrosis multiplexa? We have been talking about this. So in the skull, apart from your thickened um, skull bones, you have something called as J-shaped um, uh, J uh, J shaped cella tr uh, trussica. So normal uh, cella trussica is almost like this: is a bag with the two arms. Whereas in J, there will be hypoplasia of the anterior um, uh, pit ankle. So you will have a J shape. It's an inverted J shaped uh, cella trussica. So you will have a macrocephaly in the skull, or with a dolichocephaly, thickened cortical bones, abnormal J shaped cella trussica, and lack of pneumatization of uh, air cells, um, paranasal cavity and uh, air cells. And the mandibular angle will be obtuse. That's why they will have a protuberant uh, mandible. And the teeth are widely spaced. And when it comes to thorax, so we always say, and the one on the left side of your screen is a normal X-ray. The one on the right side is an abnormal X-ray. So what we are seeing is uh, paddle shaped or oar shaped. Oar means the one which we use in the boating. So the, X, the, the ribs, you can see, uh, it's a oar shaped uh, rib. And they will also have short and thickened clavicle and may or may not be, I mean, the uh, scoliosis may be visible in the AP view. Uh, definitely kyphosis is visible on the lateral view. So in the spine, you will have different types of beaking. Uh, so you will have craniovertebral junction. In the craniovertebral junction, you will have atlantoaxial instability, stenosis and compression. This is more common in type 4. And uh, thoracolumbar spine can have gibbous and malformation of the vertebral body. And, the, and we always talk about uh, beaking. There are two types of beaking. One is central beaking, another one is uh, inferior beaking. So usually the central type of beaking, the one which, is, which you are seeing on the uh, lower uh, right side uh, of the screen uh, is the central beaking. This is again a very typical feature of type 4 MPS. So in any child suspected with MPS, a lateral X-ray showing a central beaking always think of type 4 MPS. And when it comes to pelvis, uh, the uh, figure A is a normal pelvis, a pelvis from a normal person. And B, C and D are uh, the, uh, the uh, X-rays from uh, different types of mucopolysaccharidosis. Usually they will have this uh, round iliac wing. You can see the round iliac wing as uh, just like your elephant ear like um, uh, wing and inferior tapering of ile, uh, ilia and poor, uh, poorly developed acetabulum, underdeveloped medial portion of the proximal femoral epiphysis. So you will have the coxovalga-like deformity because of increased co uh, coxofemoral joint space. So this is your elephant wing. You can see the, in the picture A, it's a normal vertebrae where you have got the step-like um, um, pattern, that, which is lost because of hypoplasia. You typically see the elephant uh, ear like uh, 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 iliac bones. And in the hand, you have that uh, V-shaped hypoplastic distal Arnon radius. It's also called as middle lung deformity and small irregular carpal bones. So again, the uh, left uh, upper uh, uh, X-ray is a normal X-ray. I'm comparing the normal X-ray with two abnormal X-rays. So usually they will have small irregular carpal bones and um, a broad and proximally pointed short metacarpal, which is classically described as bullet-shaped phalanges. So bullet means it is a bullet, not the motor bike, uh, motorbike bullet. It is a bullet uh, which you use in the gun. So it's a bullet-shaped vertebrae. You can see the difference between the normal uh, uh, ph uh, phalangeal bones and uh, bullet-shaped uh, phalangeal bones. And in the long bones, you will have anterior posterior X-ray or femoral X-ray shows uh, bilateral genovalgum, proximal and distal epiphysis are flared and irregular and diffused cortical thinning and osteopenia. So in, in, in short, this is the disastrosis multiplexa, J-shaped vertebrae, or shaped, uh, sorry, J-shaped uh, cellar tersica, or shaped uh, vertebrae, clavicle is abnormal, uh, pelvis, uh, in the pelvis, you will have significant uh, iliac bone hypoplasia, small acetabulum, bullet-shaped uh, um, uh, phalanges, uh, made a lung deformity, and uh, irregular carpal bones and uh, beaking of the um, uh, uh, vertebral bones. So in total, this is called as disastrosis multiplexa. So in our center, 
uh, I mean, in the LSD, we have the, the maximum number of LSD, what we are seeing is MPS. This is a old data. Now it's not been updated. We are now we have reached around 500 now. So, so the most common uh, MPS, what we see in our, in our clinical setup is type four followed by type two, but worldwide it is type two, which is most common. Probably we are underdiagnosing type three because these type threes, they end up with neurologist or uh, um, psychiatrist most of the time because of behavioral problem. And, uh, and we need to also think about uh, MPS mimicker, which I already mentioned in my, um, in, the, in the previous comment. There are few conditions which will mimic like MPS. As I said, mucolipidosis is one common condition which will mimic like an um, uh, MPS. Here, the, again, they will have coarse faces, stiffened uh, joints, short stature, and there will be some amount of beaking. Here, the beaking is more of a globular beaking, and they will have bullet-shaped um, uh, phalanges. Uh, carpal bones are irregular, irregular metacarpal bones, and they will have um, uh, ribs also, slightly widened ribs, uh, hypoplasia of the uh, uh, iliac wing, but their, their um, uh, vertebrae are global rather than beaking. So pseudoachondroplasia is one more condition where X-rays are very um, uh, uh, close to the MPS X-rays. And again, this is a autosomal dominant condition. Most of the time, they will not have facial dysmorphism, but they will have short fingers and toes, extreme joint laxity here, geno recurvatum, lower leg bowing, and they will have premature osteoarthritis and joint laxity. So these, these are the pictures of um, pseudoachondroplasia. And look at the uh, beaking here. The beaking almost mimics like a type 4 MPS. But whereas uh, uh, even the hand x-ray is also slightly suggestive of MPS, but uh, uh, the the face will give you a, a pointer towards uh, not being MPS. And uh, again, over a period of time, the X-rays will become more uh, different. They will have shallow, irregular acetabular with the defects, a white triradiate cartilage and irregular femoral neck and uh, so other things. Another condition which I mentioned is the degree maclear clausen syndrome or uh, smith mccart uh, dysplasia. So these are, again, uh, children with coarse faces developmental issues and skeletal. And in the skeletal, so in the skeletal, they will have a metaphyseal and a widening of the distal and radial ulna, that is middle lung deformity. Carpal bones are short and dysplastic, uh, metacarpal bones, pharyngeal bones, and they will have this uh, acroosteolysis also in some of the, the cases. Whereas their spine, typically there is a constriction in the middle of the vertebral body uh, as compared to the uh, beaking. So there may be beaking also, but this constriction which you are seeing classically, this is uh, keeping in with uh, DMC, that is degree maclear. And the face is again, once you start seeing cases, you will see many, uh, I mean, the similar face in all the DMC, which, uh, which is not that coarse as we see in our uh, uh, MPS. And another classical finding in uh, DMC is uh, pelvis. You have something called as lacy pattern, ili iliac crest is a lacy iliac crest. So just like a lacy appearance, this is a very classical finding of DMC, which you don't see in your MPS. So whenever you are seeing a hypoplastic iliac bone, look for iliac crest. If it is a lacy, um, then it is probably we are dealing with um, DMC. So the treatment, I think already mentioned, 1H, uh, most of the time, it's, wherever there is a CNS involvement, it's always supportive therapy because your enzyme replacement or your uh, stem cell transplantation may not be helpful in that. So 1H, uh, severe mental retardation, early mental retardation is a feature. So only supportive management. Uh, whereas in case of 1S, definitely your enzyme replacement therapy will be helpful. Aldurazim is the enzyme which is available in India. We are giving it for the few patients in our setup. Uh, HSC is again a um, borderline. We are not very sure. Depends on the clinical phenotype. We can take it up. A child less than two years will definitely do well with um, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in type 1S uh, because uh, uh, the, uh, the CRS involvement will be very minimal and you can prime them with uh, a short course of enzyme replacement therapy, uh, prepare them and you can go for um, uh, uh, stem cell uh, transplantation. The outcomes are good. We have um, uh, two cases where we have done uh, enzyme, I mean, we have done hematopoietic stem cell. They are doing fine. In again, type 2, there are two forms. One is severe form, another one is attenuated form. 
attenuated form definitely you can go for um, ERT enzyme replacement therapy if a early child young child you can even go for HSCT in the western countries they don't advise a, a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, wherever uh, enzyme replacement therapy is available uh, unfortunately it is very costly and it is not freely available in our in our country we are still uh, hanging on to this uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation Type 3 is more of a supportive therapy. There are a few experimental therapy, chaffron therapy like trioxylase uh, trio, um, trio and other, other things are also used, but not much of success. Uh, at this point of time, the therapy is supportive. Most of the time, the clinical course is downhill and they don't survive uh, beyond second decade. Whereas type 4 enzyme replacement therapy is available, not in India, abroad but um, the, it's extremely costly and the long-term outcome with respect to skeletal is not very encouraging. Uh, and some of them we even tried with uh, I mean, hem uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. Um, uh, we had a couple of children who are doing fine and uh, we have to uh, look for the long-term outcome. Still, they are two years post BMT and type 6, again, ERT is available, not in India, but abroad. But again, here, um, uh, transplantation is one option we can keep in mind in our setup. So to summarize uh, the onset, early onset with respect to your um, Hurler phenotype and severe form of type 2 and type 3 around 5 years, they will start manifesting the behavioral problem, type 4 and type 6 early. The core species is very severe with um, Hurler and type 6 and uh, severe form of um, type 2, whereas uh, attenuated form and uh, I mean, definitely type 4 will not have a coarse basis, but they will have some sort of dysmorphism. And um, again, CNS involvement, which we already mentioned, uh, in the joints, you have to remember that type 4 will have a lax joint and type 3 will have very minimal joint involvement. And disastrosis multiplex, I have already mentioned, um, I mean, where it is severe. Corneal crowding is a very important finding. Most of the time, type 2 will not have corneal crowding. Type 3 may not have clinically corneal crowding, but if you look at slit land examination, there may be some corneal deposition. So these are the uh, clinical features to summarize. And this was our, um, uh, in the 2014, we did a uh, rare disease day, international rare disease day. And this is one more um, children with all types of MPS who had come for the MPS day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir, for your uh, support and excellent lecture. And uh, you are having a very good team. You are uh, doing a lot of job for the MPS children. We appreciate your skills and the knowledge. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we move to the last part of the program. We have approach to short stature and also comments on the case of achondroplasia by Dr. Raghupati, who is none other than my beloved teacher and teacher of the teachers. So, he was professor of pediatric endocrinology at uh, Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health and also at CMC Vellu. <coughs> and uh, sir is expert in skeletal dysplasia. He gave many lectures on skeletal dysplasia. And a uh, very loving teacher uh, used to teach for uh, hours together. Now, over to you, sir. Mine is a very short... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Mine is a very short talk because everything has already been covered. And uh, did you people know about this person? Jyoti Amge is the shortest human being in the world and she has been recorded by the Guinness records in 2012 and today she is a case of uh, achondroplasia who is 28 years old and 63 centimeters only and India has another distinction of having the shortest person in the whole world. And she's an actress also and a very big celebrity uh, being the shortest person. I can't replace her. Everything has been said. I thought I'll show you some classic pictures, but you've already seen that. And I just wanted to emphasize once again, the metaphysical changes here. Can you see my arrow? 
the metaphyseal changes are something which normally we don't think of okay and the trident deformity of course and the classic short limbs but normal trunk and uh, these are the pictures we were talking about bullet shape all the time in these days of gun culture i think bullets are there everywhere even in achondroplasia you can see those bullet shaped phalanges and uh, all these changes have already been described so i don't want to go ahead uh, go, go on describing this anymore and uh, sanjeev has given very classic uh, lecture on uh, the changes and uh, in the past when i was in my younger days we always used to say there is no treatment available and it was only supportive and so on but it's good to see very heartening to see that some treatment is being tried or uh, at least we understand the pathophysiology better and uh, so many things are being uh, enzyme replacement therapy for example and uh, bm n111 or oseritide was also mentioned and these are all the things that are available and what we thought was totally untreatable like metaphyseal chondrodysplasia even that there has been a trial going on and uh, engelmann syndrome losartan so things like uh, you know uh, commonly used antihypertensives even for marfans you would have thought of you would have uh, known learnt about treatment being available and uh, so on and uh, a short uh, uh, few slides about short stature in children because amarnath insisted that i talk and i found that all of us dr amisha and dr sanjeeva and i are all um, post graduate oriented we didn't want to make it very complicated and i am glad we are all like minded and i hope all the candidates will get some student friendly examiners like us and this is uh, an algorithm for evaluation of short stature as dr amy shaw was saying this is a very very simplified one i'll make it even simpler so what do you think is short stature any height below two standard deviations below the mean for age height velocity less than 5 cm per year and height more than two standard deviations below the mid parietal height and uh, when you have these conditions you think of either an endocrine cause or a gi cause most common one is hypothyroidism it could be also cushing's disease and an excess of steroids can cause deceleration of height and uh, if it is a gastrointestinal condition you will have to think of celiac and um the i mean irritable bowel disease and so on and uh, remember also this also requires evaluation for short stature if they slip from a higher centile to lower centile and that's also something which should be evaluated for deviation from the normal and this is a classic example i can't ask questions in this uh, virtual audience but this is a classic example of the weight increasing and the height decreasing this is a classic example of cushings okay the other thing is also been mentioned you will have to see whether the child is proportionate or disproportionate if the child is disproportionate it is skeletal dysplasia if the child is proportionate but dysmorphic then you think of downs and turner and if the child is proportionate and not dysmorphic then you look at the height velocity if the height velocity is 5 cm or more with a bone age delay then you think of constitutional delay of growth and puberty we'll come to that in a little while and uh, if the child is not dysmorphic but the height velocity is normal bone age is normal and the predicted height is equal to the mid parental height then it is familial short stage and if the child is not dysmorphic and is proportionate but the height velocity is very low bone age is delayed and the weight is normal or high you think of endocrine causes like growth hormone deficiency or 
pseudo hypoparathyroidism and this is the same thing which i have put in a big slide if i show you this everybody gets frightened but it's as simple as that and as i said i have tried to make it as simple as possible these are the screening laboratory tests which uh, all of you know and uh, even for uh, even for uh, evaluation of short stature you would have got so many tables in so many textbooks and uh, you are all familiar i suppose now this is a very typical growth chart look at this the child has been growing steadily and parallel to the regular growth chart lines and uh, is steadily growing which means the height velocity is normal and the puberty is delayed here and after that the child catches up and becomes normal in height sometimes they reach even 6 feet but the most important thing here is the history the family history of close relatives either the parents themselves both father and mother or their first degree relatives their own brothers and sisters will have a, the same history of being the shortest in their class during their childhood during their school age and uh, having attained puberty or uh, signs of puberty or menarche in girls later than usual and ultimately catching up having a sudden growth spurt this is a classic case of constitutional growth delay and mature uh, maturity or puberty i prefer to call it maturational growth delay maturity is delayed growth is also delayed and uh, some of the word constitution doesn't mean anything to me this is familial short stature which i told you again the growth velocity is normal and they are growing along the third centile but the mid parental target height is here and that's where they eventually uh, reach okay and uh, all that growth chart is possible only if growth in height is measured regularly all pediatricians are very guilty of measuring only the weight and not the height i always insist that all of us should have the height being measured at least once in 3 months or 6 months if they are coming to you regularly not in the first 5 years but after the age of 5 it's very important that the height is measured look at this grandfather fathers are useless fathers are always busy but the grandfather here is uh, measuring the height of all his three grandchildren every year on the same date in january and uh, you can see how meticulously he has kept a uh, record height record and if he can do it why can't doctors why can't pediatricians do height recording and plot also on the growth chart the uh, we have got beautiful iap growth charts um, charted or uh, devised by dr maman kadilkar and uh, you should plot these values and that gives you an immediate picture of the child i'll skip that now what is the treatment for cdgp the only treatment that is necessary is to provide reassurance we just have to wait and patience pays so ultimately as i to showed you they develop puberty at a slightly later date than normal and ultimately grow into normal height individuals or sometimes they even grow very tall taller than normal the final height will be normal you have to reassure them and uh, it is relative to the parental heights but only thing is you need to wait and uh, sometimes they may be even taller than the mid parental height target and this history is very important the first degree relative history should be obtained and if they don't know you ask them to find out from their parents and come back with the history they may have psychological issues being bullied in school and so on you need to be supportive for that and short term sex therapy is occasionally beneficial only if the bone age is less than 12 years in boys and they are not developing uh, signs of puberty even at 14 or 15 just to give a kick start we give testosterone injections monthly for 3 or 6 months and then puberty starts off 
if pubertal signs appear, then the progress continues even after stopping uh, testosterone. For familial short stature, what do you do? We don't do anything. The recombinant growth hormone for uh, familial short stature has been tried, and it showed only a marginal increase of 2.5 centimeters in the final height. You can easily understand that this is not an appreciable increase for such an exorbitant cost of growth hormone treatment and daily injections and so on. So uh, this is just one study. There are several limitations to this study because we are not having sufficient numbers to draw any conclusion. There are lack of controls and different doses of growth hormone has been used and uh, there may be undiagnosed pathological conditions also. But uh, even abroad, the FDA has not approved growth hormone treatment for this condition. Thank you. I don't want to uh, unnecessarily prolong my talk because all the issues have been discussed already. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, any comments on role of growth hormone in uh, achondroplasia, sir? Oh, oh, I forgot uh, that slide is missing. Um, achondroplasia also, it has been tried and uh, the results are not all that glamorous. And uh, so personally, I wouldn't try growth hormone because it's very expensive. It gives unnecessarily false hopes to uh, the parents. And uh, uh, Sanjeeva mentioned about uh, leg lengthening procedure and even Dr. Amisha. I feel it's really cruel to subject the child for uh, leg lengthening procedures. Personally, I wouldn't do it uh, for my own child or my own grandchild. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, only there are studies from uh, more from the Japan and uh, some studies done by Dr. Maman Khadilkar, sir, for few patients. At present, we are not using growth hormone in achondroplasia patients. So, any comments from other uh, <coughs> teachers? I personally thank uh, Raghupati, sir. So, I know he prepares uh, every time. Now, I am feeling like I should give uh, MD, DCHR, DNB exam again and become a fellow like that. So, thank you very much for uh, giving extraordinary knowledge like uh, giving food in uh, the banana leaf like that. You made the session very <coughs> lucid and tasty, sir. I want to it's ask uh, Dr. Sanjeeva whether his initial GN stands for the abbreviation genetics. Is he there? Sanjeeva, sir. I think uh, he's busy, sir. No, oh, the... Uh, ah. Dr. Sanjeeva? Yes, yeah, sir. Sorry, I missed that comment. I mean, uh, your initial GN, is it abbreviation for genetics? <laughs> no, 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 sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was thinking I must congratulate your, I must congratulate your uh, parents for thinking of that. <laughs> they were so. You know, far ahead of times, <laughs> they knew you were going to specialize in genetics. I didn't even thought about that, sir. <laughs> for this day, <laughs> you, 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 that that clinician sharp mind from you, which had picked up this. <laughs> anyway, nice of you to join and to give a very uh, yeah. lucid lecture. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. It's, it's we thank Jainab and uh, Sahana for excellent presentation. And we thank Dr. Vani and uh, Dr. Amisha for excellent preparation and guiding the postgraduates. And uh, we thank all the participants and uh, Sudha Madam, Sanjeeva sir, Raghupati sir, RX events for giving this chance. We wish you all the best for exam going students. We wish you happy Diwali. So it's starting from today, even then the attendance was 50. So once again, we thank the team ISPE for excelling ISPE 2022 team. And uh, we thank Shaila Madam and everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Love you all.
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Best of wishes to all the postgraduates. We can stop, uh, Mayank. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah.